So without further ado, let's get things uh, let's get things started. And first up, we have a virtual presenter, Caitlin Daly. Caitlin is joining us from the University of Colorado and has worked with Alex Rugg Stebbins and Rachel McCrary on a project titled Assessing the Impact of Global Warming on Drought in the so Southwest United States. Um, and Caitlin, I see you there. Are you ready to go? All right, the floor is yours. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Give me a second then. Let me share my screen. There we go. Looks great. Excellent. Here goes nothing. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kitten Daly, and I would like to share some of the research I did over the summer on drought in the southwestern United States and how future climate change will impact the region. This is the current map from the U.S. drought monitor. I did not look for the data they used to make this, but it is useful for contextualizing the data and research I'll show you later. Because while the Southwest isn't in bad shape on this map, Colorado and South and Southwestern United States have been in one of the driest multi-year periods since records began. Given the rise to major drought that has put so much stress on the Reasons water supply that when negotiations over the Colorado River stalled last year, the federal government considered stepping in. The core of my work this summer was working with nine weather research and forecasting or work model ones within the IM3 hyperbasis thermodynamic global warming simulation data set. These ones were based on the observations um, base error by. We announced this data and went for 40 years each. But one historical run starting from 1980 and eight future runs spanning these two time periods from the present day to 2060 and from 2060 to the end of the century. The eight runs were also split between two representative climate pathways or different levels of CO2 concentration, RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5, and, and split again between two different temperature responses to greenhouse gas emissions on each of the pathways, as you can see on the diagram. Some of them will go warmer, some of them will go cooler. Some of you may have already caught a minor issue, but those not need to know what requires some form of initial boundary conditions to start a run. And you can just generate those um, using what for the fall beach run because it's not intended to large scale climate simulations like the community earth system model developed here at NSF Anchor. We did something clever instead. The future runs are known to the historical one, but with the boundary conditions modified, such say at the temperature and humidity um, we would expect from the atmosphere and these are the futures we were looking at. This is the methodology used to pseudo this is the methodology called procedural global warming, and lets us directly compare the data we have from historical events against the occurrence in the future ones. On the right, you can see an example using two plots of average typical across the southwest as generated. One from the historical one right here, and then the other from the harder end century, RCP 8.51. You can clearly see the impact the boundary conditions have on the temperature ranges. So what are the questions I intended to answer this summer? There are three. How are droughts in southwestern United States change in the warmer world? How much do temperature and precip amounts contribute to those changes? And what are the consequences of the answers to number one and number two in the context of the Colorado River Basin? There was also a point when I went into the project intended to answer, but as you will see in a moment, the answer quickly became a lot messier than I expected it to be for reasons I will go into when I talk about number two. So to answer that first question, I looked at three drought indices and all the ones. The first one is SPEI, or the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index, which relies a lot on temperature, a lot more on temperature than our second one, the SSMI, the standardized soil moisture index, which, direct, which directly measures the water content in the ground. And finally, the PDSI, or the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which uses both temperature and precip. And I found that CO2 concentrations increase 
And I found that as CO2 concentrations increase and the environmental response to those CO2 levels intensify, the wealth that would occur in these swamps became more severe. However, that answer comes with two caveats. The first caveat is to use a phrase that ended up crossing my mind many times this summer, the extremes become more extreme. This is better shown in the maps of the story and moisture index, like the one on the right here. As a note, the colors here represent different levels of drought and moisture, where white being normal and brown and green represent areas that are dry and areas that are wet, respectively. Each number on the bar here represents a threshold as well, with negative 0.5 being a point where a region crosses over from normal to snap drought, and then negative 0.8 representing the crossing from snap drought to just drought and in some. Same rules also apply for the cost of the families on the green side of the bar, just in the other direction. The second caveat is best summed up in the complaint I made when I found it. Something unexpected is happening in the cooler runs, and I'm 99% sure I call it this thing correctly. As I alluded to earlier, some of these runs have a less intense response to greenhouse gas emissions, and those runs, for some reason, tend to have much broader areas in drought than the ones with a warmer response. You can see this on the right if you compare the um, 8.5 cool one on the bottom left with the 8.5 cool one warmer one on the bottom right, paying particular attention to the four points. This is obviously something that needs more research, as I will talk about later. I am not going to let this next animation play all the way through, but I want you to get a feel for how as we increase CO2 concentrations, as we move left to right and top to bottom on the speaker, alternating between cooler and warmer responses, the drought become more severe. It is probably most easily seen if you compare the scorp run and top net with the warmest one on the bottom right. Moving to the second question, or how temperature increase of contribution to these drought patterns, the key thing to understand is that the southwest is arid. Um, this place has three out of four of the United States major deserts, and one of them, the Great Basin in Nevada, doesn't drain anywhere. Water just sits there and evaporates eventually. In a lot of places, especially arid ones, there's this concept called a water person. Most of the time, this can, this can be supplied to precip what's coming in minus evapotranspiration or ET, what's going out. And most part of that second term in arid regions is just pure evaporation. Which approximately tracks the temperature. So the higher temperatures translate into higher heat. Precip, on the other hand, is not straightforward as I found out. As I show in a moment, I could not find a relationship between excessive moisture and warmer climate because the totals don't change much across simulations and, in fact, only slightly increases in some places. I can think of two reasons for this pattern. The first one is simple warmer air can hold more water. And the second one is that Northern California keeps them a lot of insimilations and will be my totals. To back up a bit to when we were talking about temperature, the map on the right is the same as the earlier map of temperatures I showed you, except the data is limited to set the summer months, comparing the historic one against the hottest one. You can see how summers in that one are significantly hotter, leading to more AT. These a two graphs show increase of trends over the 40 years of each one, but the 4.5 ones on top and the 8.5 ones on bottom. You can see how all the ones very closely track each other when the limit of variability. This is the map of the amount and spatial distribution of precip and the historical and hardest one. There's a slight decrease over the four corners. Which is offset by the chaos in Northern California. And this is a map of the historical and spatial, excuse me, this is a map of the amount and spatial distribution of ET and historical and hardest ones. It can be hard to see, but especially in the desert regions, there's a change in ET that can now uh, make some features in the state. And this it's a map of precip minus ET, and it's really where we can see these streams getting more extreme, particularly in Northern California. And this is a map of the precip totals of the harder 8.51 minus the cooler 8.51. We see the massive increase in 
in California that consistently ruined my food. But we have to see brown in the four corners area where the cooler one is more appreciated than the hotter one, leading many more Koreans to the bottom of my and in Portsmouth, where these streams become more extreme. And now for the case study of the Colorado River. Our main concern here is hyperological drought, which occurs when the water supply in the region becomes so limited that stream flow, reservoir levels, and groundwater, groundwater levels drop. Thankfully, no one sipping things up or down the Colorado River, so that's not an issue. However, seven states draw water from the river for agricultural, industrial, and domestic needs. So if the river dries up, we have a problem. And of course, as these things tend to go, we do have a problem. I looked at the years 2003 and 2018 because both were major drought years in the basin, and both were much worse than the future ones. <laughs> And out of the basin, the subject to these streams become more extreme phenomenon, as we saw them last night, and the increased temperatures in the region do not help. This slide shows the drought year of 2018 under the standardized precipitation and beverage transformation index metric. And the short five said earlier about the drought becoming more severe, but higher CO2 concentrations and the more intense temperature response. Now, how the bottom right drought is a solid ground. Indicating SPEI values of no negative two. This slide shows the drought through the standardized soil moisture index metric. And here we can really see the two caveats I mentioned earlier in play. Now, as I said earlier, soil moisture doesn't depend so much on the temperature as SPEI does. So, let's just see some of the oddities I pointed out a little earlier. Um, better. Like how we get northern streams in 20. 98 on the OCP hollow one on the bottom, on, on the far bottom right, and the bottom ground areas in the 2018, excuse me, 2098 OCP 8.5 core one right next to it. In conclusion, the TZW simulations predict that drought intensity in the southwest United States, and particularly the Colorado River Basin, will increase across drought metrics as temperature goes up. Although the Response of precipitation to increase temperature is complex and nonlinear. And there are few areas of, of potential for future research. How valid are the caveats I found while analyzing drought caps? Is there some connection I failed to draft that led to the cooler ones having broader drought areas? And why does precipitation respond the way it does in these simulations? Is the southwest of the United States somehow receiving even drier air in the future ones? And these about Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Wonderful job. Uh, do we have some questions for Caitlin? Uh, again, we can take questions both in person here in the main seminar room, but also we are taking questions online as well. For those of the, you that are joining online, you can scroll down and there should be a Slido to be able to uh, ask questions there. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. That was awesome. Um, I was wondering what you found the most interesting or most pressing um, finding uh, from your projections um, in terms of impacts. I'm <laughs> um, I would say that it's um, purely the fact that with higher CO2 concentrations and um, we, that the droughts become more severe. We don't quite know the um, exact response of our environment to those increased greenhouse gas emissions currently. So the, um, the fact that you can almost um, Link the um, more severe drought to um, higher CO2 concentrations is probably the most pressing finding um, in all of it. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Hello, yeah, <laughs> I'm James here from NCAR. Yeah, thanks for the nice work. Um, I was just wondering if you'd looked at uh, different timescales of drought. 
Uh, you mentioned on one of your slides that in a warming world, the extremes become more extreme. And there's been a popular notion in, in the media about these flash droughts, these sudden onset droughts that might respond to changes in like shorter timescale precipitation, like a week, a week or two timescale. So um, I wondered if you'd thought about the duration of drought and how that might be changing. Um, I didn't. I didn't put this in um in the uh, slide, so obviously, but um, I feel like the the drought, not only is drought severity increasing, but also the length of time. There are some areas in the southwest that are actually um becoming permanently aridified, like um especially under the eight point five um simulations. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Do we have any online? Okay, I think we're good. Great job, Caitlin. Thank you. Hope we get to see you in person here soon. Thank you.